Um, hello and welcome to your first session at J&D on 2018 in Cologne. My name got printed to my t-shirt. My parents decided that this is uh, spelled like Gene. I'm working at Hosting DE and I'm somewhere between the operations and the software development team. So on a typical day, you will see me doing some server work, some programming, and then a lot of being met with everybody else and myself. Now comes my friend and colleague, Michael, who will introduce himself and our topic. Okay, I think we have to switch. Yeah. Okay, hi, my name is Michael. I am the CSO of hosting.de. Um, I started developing software, or but let's better say I got serious about it right about 15 years ago when I first started studying at the University of Aachen. Um, for me, the, oh, the most important things about developing software are clean code, clear structure, responsibilities, and symmetry in code. So over the last couple of years, my mission at hosting.de was to build a software stack that is well-designed and written, well-maintained, and runs smoothly. Okay, most of the time. <laughs> so um, if you have any questions about our software stack, join us at our booth, we will answer all your questions. So <clears throat> who or what is hosting.de? Well, a few of you might have guessed it, we are in the business of hosting services. Those typically include services like managing domain names and zones, we are managing your websites and applications, and we are running an email server and cluster for your email services. You can also create virtual machines where you are the boss, or you can create managed servers where you are getting dedicated resources for yourself, and you are managing your web spaces and databases through our customer interface. So up to this point, nothing really out of the ordinary. But, well, we have a public API. So every service we offer, we offer through our public API. This means if you are using our customer interface, it actually is only talking to our API. So let's, for, uh, let's say for a second that you are not happy with the color scheme we picked for our interface. You can sit down and write your own. Our interface it has no special privileges at all. So everything our interface does, you can do as well. This also means that um, you can integrate our services perfectly in your own applications or into your processes. A few numbers about uh, hosting.de. At the moment, we are 31 colleagues and uh, this number is always rising. So sometimes it's hard to keep track. We have uh, more than 35,000 customers and we are managing more than 250,000 uh, virtual hosts and more than 5,000 virtual machines for them. Okay, oh, it's a little bit dark, but let's come to the point why you all actually are here. So over the last couple of months, we had a lot of internal discussions and we had discussions with our customers about the features we are going to impl implement next. So out of these discussions, most of the time one question arose and this was, what are you actually doing? So up to this point, we had no <coughs> real idea what our customers <coughs> actually are running on their web spaces and therefore on our servers. So even if you are using our app installer and you are installing an application on your web space, we are doing this for you, but after that, we are forgetting all about it. So <coughs> the knowledge, no? the knowledge what application you're running on your web space actually could help us to improve our support. We could point out errors in your configuration uh, we, give you t we could give you tips how you can improve the configuration of your Wii host so that your application is running more securely and at its best. Additionally, the knowledge what kind of applications are running on the web server could help us to optimize our infrastructure. Which room number? Room number two? Two. two. Yes. Ah, okay. I mean, it could help us actually to uh, improve or uh, optimize our infrastructure. Let's imagine for a second that we have a web server with a lot, a lot of Magento installations. So it's fair to assume that at one point, the load of the server might get very high and therefore impacting other customers as well. So a possible cause of action would be to migrate some of those web spaces to other servers. Okay, so the question now is, how can we actually find out what kind of applications you have on your web spaces? Well, yes, we can look at each web space manually. We can write some scripts utilizing tools like Crap and Find. 
uh, which means in general that you're looking for some kind of a version file extracting information that you are requiring. Or you can use existing tools like the CMS Garden Scanner, which actually is also looking for a CMS, uh, for a configuration or a version file, extracting the information and reporting back to you. Okay, but there are some issues. Okay, I think this one is quite obvious. Um, if you are writing tools or scripts that should identify a software, you have to adapt your script for every software you're trying to identify. You should also take into consideration that the syntax of such a version file might break between versions, and you should take in consideration the user himself, because a version file might be empty or it might not even be there. And, of course, a version file doesn't have to tell the truth. At some point, we found a Joomla version 10 on, on one of our web servers, so that's that. As you can imagine, those prospects made us less than happy. Yeah, or less than happy, well, let's put it a little bit, a little bit shorter. We were kind of screwed, so we knew there is software available, but it's not completely, um, completely uh, covering our case. Um, anyway, we went forward because with enough, with enough effort, we knew that we could find something, so we sampled our servers. For this, we took some systems with old customers or long-term customers, some newer servers, and some servers with websites that got migrated into our system. So those are uh, customers who got migrated into our system by means of uh, company acquisitions. Um, to make this a little bit more interesting, uh, here we have uh, brought three different cases how our findings might have looked like. As you can see, we have uh, taken the blue marker for installations that are up to date. So this is 3.8.7 as of today. For uh, the orange, we have, a pet, uh, we have installations that are patched to 3.8, and then the rest is really old stuff. So maybe just by show of hands, we can have a, a small poll. Who thinks that figure A is uh, corresponding to our findings? <laughs> wow, oh, <no>. okay. Who <laughs> 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 thinks we are looking at figure B in our findings? Yeah, that's me. Okay. Two. I'm quite confident. Two. And who thinks we are looking at figure C? Okay, that's almost everybody. Fine. Let's, let's have a closer look. So first look at figure A. Well, that's not actually our numbers, but it's a study about free roaming cats. <laughs> and we found this and uh, it goes somewhere about uh, what happens to uh, the prey of a free roaming cat. So if any cat owners are in the room, you might learn something here. Um, you shouldn't be mad at your friend when he brings you a gift from a nightly stroll, because that's one of the rarer cases. So you should be really honored. Second case, um, that was your yeah. So this is a study on swear words used in GitHub commit messages. And you can see that programmers uh, don't have a really large vocabulary. <laughs> I didn't have guessed that. And uh, another cool thing here is, uh, if you are looking at the slides later, you can download them on our GitHub, or we will upload them. Yeah, we will upload them. Um, you uh, will find out that the re researcher went ahead and split all of this up by programming language. So if you are about to learn <coughs> a new language, maybe you want to look at the study first and then choose another language. Okay, finally, <coughs> let's have a look at figure C. Well, at least those numbers are from <laughs> us. <laughs> it's, it's about uh, what beverages get consumed at our coffee machine. Uh, as you can see, we are big fans of coffee. Every, uh, every employee gets a special elite training in the maintenance of the machine. So, True. If for example, for example <laughs> I can disassemble, clean, and reassemble the machine within 10 minutes blindfold. <coughs> now, honestly, what is the actual result? I don't think you trust me right now, but <laughs> <laughs> those are the actual numbers. So we have 10% patched to 3.8.7. Then we have 7% in the 3.8 range and 83% below 3.8. Let's make this a little bit clearer because, well, this is just, just part of the truth here. So if we break this up a little bit more, we see 30% below, uh, below uh, in the 30% in the 3.7 to 3.0 range, and then 53 actually below 3.0, which got retired in 2013. So on the, on the, uh, on the uh, lower uh, part of the slide, you have those even more broken down to 63% being just about as old, or just about old enough to buy beer. 
So this is a very sad state, I would guess, but it's reality. Um, let's see why I, I think this is so sad. Well, for you, for customers, there are three main things that are really bad about this. First, th first thing coming to mind is uh, loss of uh, reputation. Imagine you are generating revenue from your website, like in a webshop scenario, and your customers start getting uh, warnings by Google or Firefox about the security of their page. Well, those customers are not going to buy anything. Then secondly, we have loss of availability. We found out that even hackers do syntax errors, and then you get uh, error 500 in HTTP or the famous white page of death. And uh, of course, if we get informed that your page does malicious things, we have to block you. And then you have to call us and get into action. And then the third point, which is uh, very important for me, or it's close to my heart, heart is it uh, can be really hard for people to find out when and what got compromised. And then even having a backup from that time and space that is restorable is the whole another point. For us as hosters, uh, our main concern is blacklisting, especially in, in, uh, in uh, the case of email. Imagine email goes down, well, people tend to lose it. It's really, really not, not nice to be in the office when email goes out. Uh, another thing is performance. Everybody likes performance. We like performance. Our customers like performance. Hackers do like performance. Why do hackers like performance? Well, it's a very common thing today that a site gets compromised and then um, with a compromise, the hacker uploads a small script and starts mining cryptocurrency. And if you have a lot of websites, uh, uh, if you have a lot of websites um, generating cryptocurrency in your, in your uh, data center, your web, web, your web servers start grinding to a slow halt. And lastly, DDoS. DDoS is kind of like the same story uh, as with the cryptocurrency. So a script gets uploaded, and with that, the attacker starts attacking other customers or other web hosters. We are coming back in this in this range of well, now other web hosters start to put us on blacklists, and we we stop being available, and other web hosters stop being available. So it's a bad, 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 bad loss, 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 loss situation there. Um, after we, we have seen this, well, what can we do about it? Yeah, what can we do? What can we do? Well, huh? okay. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, always make sure that your website is up to date and that you have a clean backup you can go back to in case you are, get compromised. So the question here is, who is actually going to take care of it? Well, the customer could. But to be honest, uh, I think they really uh, get annoyed fast when they should look for updates on a regular basis. So <clears throat> they could ask a web agency to take care of these jobs for them. Or you can use one of those web services to do the job for you. So they are actually scanning your websites on a regular basis uh, automatically and they are looking for malware. So besides other stuff, of course. So <coughs> depending on the plan you have booked with them, the range for each check goes from 24 hours to 30 minutes. So it seems there are some solutions. Are we done? Mm, I still have some slides. Ah, so. Okay, shit. So it seems that we have still some issues with those solutions. Well, if you are using one of those web services, some of them require you to install an add-on into your application. This basically means that you are uh, opening a remote access to your web space to someone else. And there are actually some services which require FTP or SSH credentials for them to work. So your web space basically is still just as secure as those services you are using. But the bigger point here is time. So Imagine for a moment we spent some money and we bought one of those plans which is checking our web space on a regular basis in 30 minutes. In a worst case scenario, this still gives an attacker a 30 minute time frame to hack your site, steal your data, use it, use it for spamming or deface it. So with this in mind, for us the goal was clear. The only thing that we want to do was real-time detection. Yeah, so real-time detection, 
How do we get to this, this picture? Well, it's quite easy because we all do know the films. We just need guns. Now, honestly, let's take some uh, building blocks, what we can do, and talk about those. Uh, as Michael already said, we wanted an application independent approach so that we don't have to adapt our strategy when a new CMS uh, is released. And maybe also we want to have some, uh, some means to integrate things that you have developed and be able to detect those also. Um, what we do for this is we create uh, something we call a hash-based fingerprint. Uh, I'm going to explain this in the next slide because this sounds a lot like it's coming from CSI Cyber. Um, then we need uh, some means to monitor file changes in real time. Another interesting figure to uh, the rate of things going bad here is, um, well, if, um, um, if a vulnerability is released, you typically see the first uh, uh, proof of concept um, exploits within the first 24 hours. And 24 hours after that, you can see first exploits in the wild. That is something, yeah, okay, he, he's even showing less. But, but that's about the ballpark that we are seeing for things like the last exploit uh, around uh, Drupal, for example. Uh, then next, we want to be able to categorize changes. So for example, you uh, are just switching your CMS installation or you, in the, or you are in the unlikely case of actually doing a, an, uh, a patch, uh, an, a security patch. Um, and lastly, we want to react to things that actually are malicious to your site. Uh, Hash-based fingerprinting sounds really weird, but in fact, it's quite easy. So you just need to download a software, a CMS, for example, in one version. You take every file from that and you store the path where the file will be installed later, uh, later and the hash of the file. And all of this you can store into a database. So if you are later scanning through a web space, you will, find, uh, you will, have, you will have the ability to find all hashes to a specific version and then you can say, well, about 95% sure, this is Joomla version 3.7, for example. Um, sounds totally easy. It gets hard when you start and uh, have to download everything. So, so for example, uh, some people or, or let's let's start with this a bit a bit different. Um, everybody is free to release uh, his software by his own means, and that's fine. That's good. Um, it's kind of pro problematic for me because well, I have to download everything and I have to crawl and I have to crawl through each uh, vendor's website. And those websites may vastly differ in their uh, building. So Joomla has some categorization around the page I've seen. So uh, you can either click on, I want version 2.0 download links, 2.3 download links, uh, and 1.0 download links. So that's kind of hard to crawl, but even, uh, even when I'm looking at, well, suddenly there will be version four. Um, then some people have uh, FTP downloads. I haven't found many. But there, are, but, but there are some. Some people released via GitHub and their own project site. Uh, that's fine. But when you are running a maintainer script after you have done your release on GitHub, then you effectively are giving me two version 3.7s of your software. And I have to decide, well, what's the one that our customers might have installed? I may scan both. I may scan just one of them. It's kind of a mixed reality there. Um, then. Uh, third part, uh, th third thing to this is um, packaging. So imagine you are um, you are creating a CMS and you are rendering something <coughs> like themes. Those th those themes might be released with their own version by other maintainers. So best case, you are releasing your software and you are looking at the releases of the theme, and you are taking one version release. But I can't guarantee this. So you basically could have gone just, well, I went into my theme folder and uh, typed in git pull master, YOLO, make a zip and release it. And now I have to differ between releases that are officially versioned from the maintainer of the, of the theme and something that got released by a maintainer of a CMS. Um, let's say I can do all of this and those are just some parts. Michael can tell a lot of stories where I'm really mad. Um, let's say I can just build some of, some of these indexes. Uh, I can take this and give it to my favorite developers and ask them to scan our servers. All right. So, <coughs> no. now we have an index which we can ask uh, to which application a file actually belongs to. 
So the next step would be to detect modifications. How can we do that? Well, um, Linux comes with a few tools that you might use, um, but sadly none of them were really equipped for our case. So there is for one Ionotify, which actually would have uh, done the job, but Ionotify has a big performance problem. So if you uh, imagine you have a web server with thousands and thousands of files, Ionotify, Ionotify is simply not suited for that. Then there is FRNotify, which has no performance problems, but has other major downsides. So there are no events for creating, deleting, and renaming files. Imagine for a second you have a file index.php, you rename it to index1.php, insert some malicious code, and rename it, rename it back. FRNotify is not able to tell you that index.php actually was changed. So this is kind of a problem. So we sat down and thought, okay, if none of the tools is working, we are going to ask the Linux kernel directly. So we wrote an interface that uh, uses the auditing framework of Linux to monitor syscalls and extract from those syscalls the required events. So now we are able to get events for creating, deleting, modifying, and renaming files. That's good. So. Now <coughs> we are actually able to detect the changes. So if a file is changed, we have two ways this could go. The first one is we recognize the new fingerprint. This could be uh, in one or two uh, different scenarios as Jean already mentioned. So you could change your CMS you had already installed or you are actually doing an update. So in those cases, we do nothing. We consider this a good change. In case we do not know the fingerprint, we assume that it's a malicious change. So we analyze the modification. We are going to inform <coughs> the customer so he can become active. And in case the an uh, analysis actually detected the malicious change, we are going to update an index so that we can react in the future more quickly. Okay. Um, to show you those tools, we actually have prepared a demo and uh, I've set up a little Joomla website. Yes. And for the moment, let's pretend that Gene isn't actually the nice guy, but in fact, an evil, evil hacker who is now going to hack my website. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. A uh, small word before this, on the right hand, hand side you see my shell. Uh, on the left hand side Michael will tail some log files later. Um, in practice those exploits will look a little bit different because let's be real, nobody has time to do this manually. So in reality most scripts are just running through IP spaces or domain name spaces and searching for exploitable websites and then pwning those. Uh, I have used a small uh, CLI script. Those are all looking relatively the same. So you get a nice GUI and you can decide what to do. Well, I'm just about messing with Michael, so I'm going to deface the page. And that should be done. Okay, let's have a look what happened. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Matt uh, designing skills. Okay, <clears throat> as you all can see, my website obviously is hacked. So what would happen next? Well, in case you are frequenting your own website on a regular basis, you might find out that your website is hacked quite quickly. If you are using one of those web services uh, we mentioned before, they also might send you a report based on the uh, plan you, you uh, booked with them between 30 and uh, minutes and 24 hours. But as mentioned, this still gives an attacker a lot of time to actually do uh, stuff with your website. And if you don't have any of those tools in place, your, this hack even might be in place for days or even weeks. So 
the better solution would be here if I got an information in a more timely manner, don't you think? Okay, so please restore my website. <laughs> okay, so the website is fine again. Let's go back and this time we are changing the security settings of my web space. So we are now trying to detect the changes. All right. So I think I have uh, showed up enough of my elite level uh, web design skills. So this time around, I could just use the brick option and it's basically doing the same, the same thing. Okay. So <clears throat> as you can see, um, is it difficult to read? Uh, can it be bigger or something? Not, uh, yeah. Better? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Friends, Matthias? Uh, hmm. Yeah, live demo. Live demo. Yes, yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, here, the tool detected the changes, and if I'm looking at my website, okay, it's broken, but now I go to my inbox, and hey, I already got an information that a file on my web space actually was changed. So at this point, I can become active, I can restore a backup, I can ask a web agency to handle the problem. So. This is a, a better way than to wait 30 minutes or 24 hours. But it would be most awesome if I even have to become active at all. So let's try this gene. Restore my site, please. Okay, so the site is fine again. And this time we changed the security setting of the web space. So we are trying to automatically repair the site. <coughs> so as of our test, this will happen very fast. So have a look at this screen there. Okay, so the site is broken. And as you can see here, the tool already performed the rollback on the changed file. Okay, so my site is still intact. Lucky me, I already got an information that here, according to my security settings, the file was replaced by its uh, original content. Um, and this information also should maybe get me thinking so that I might update my installation. Okay, so much for the demo part. Thanks a lot. So we basically can see that Michael can run arbitrarily old installations right now, which might be good, might be bad. Uh, what else can we do? Where can we, where can we go from that? Well, something that we are thinking about is uh, analyzing and storing HTTP request methods. Because with that information, we can go back in case of an infection and can try to find out what really happened to your page. And with that information, we can go to other researchers or to us, to our team, to our teams, and look, well, here is a potentially a bad thing that happened to, happening to all installations of that version. Um, and then lastly, well, open source. We, are, we both, <coughs> both think that uh, we can help to make the internet a safer place. So for example, if we could get the scanner component in your hands on your servers, you would all be able to just to roll back whenever you, whenever you want or even employ other scripts and other me mechanics after you found malicious code. Um, with that said, I'd like to thank all of you for, for your attention. If you have questions, feel free to ask us. Do you really have websites after working hour? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not really allowed to talk about this. Maybe, maybe we can do that off camera. Um, do we have questions from the tool? Or? No. <laughs> no. No. Okay, so still if you have any, any questions uh, about this or about our software stack, just join us at our booth. Uh, some of our team members are actually here today. So.
if you are not happy with the UI or with the back end, <laughs> there's always someone to point the finger to. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, have fun at the other class.